I'm working in the style of others. It's a challenge by the Appalachian Pastel Society. It's a great group. And every now and then we do an adventure series. This series was to do a painting and then do it in the style of some other master painters. My choice, instead of using the classic masters, was to shoot to employ the techniques or the ideas that I have of the techniques of some modern masters. So I've chosen the pastel, eminent pastelists, and today I am going to try in the style of Lynn Aselta. Lynn Aselta is one of my favorite pastel artists and she has been for years. Her style is just beautiful and rich and multi-textured. This is an example of one of hers. And I want to play around with it. There's a soft infusion. Her aerial perspective and her acuity perspective are very strong as well as linear perspective. Of course, I just have a simple tree but I want to employ some of her approaches. Of course, I don't know exactly how Lynn does it. I've seen her paint, I've seen demos, but I can't copy exactly. But I'm using that as a takeoff of a style and an idea of where I want to go with my painting. I'm using pan pastels at this point to lighten this background. I'm on a dark paper, which is wiggling tremendously. I think that's why I had a problem with the other one the other day, because the artist I was emulating had a very strong mark style. It was Tony Elaine. And because I haven't properly braced my easel here. It's just <laughs> kind of moving all around. All right, getting in the, a nice, I think I want to keep this more on the warm side for this painting. Add in a little warmth. The pan pastels, you can cover some area quickly, which is nice. This I'm using just to tie in the color from above to below. Pan pastels do that so quickly. It's so nice. It's wonderful. When Lynn paints, I've seen her often start with an acrylic ink underpainting, which Right now, I don't have my acrylic inks with me. I'm in a studio that's portable and on the move. So I am going to refer back to my tools that I have at hand. One of those is my vine charcoal or willow charcoal, either one. They're about the same. Laying in some areas very quickly to have an idea where I'm going to go with this painting. Now I'm not giving myself a lot of time to create these. And I'm doing them quickly. And I don't have a rag on me right now, so I need to reach over here and get a rag. If I'm somewhat following Lynn's example in this, I'm going to try to stick with some of her colors that she uses in that particular image that I was referring to. Nice kind of gray-blue. I'm doing a light touch as it blends into the background. 
a little softer, letting it fade into the distance. At this point, nothing really strong, no powerful details. The essence of a tree. I'm going to need to hold this board because I want from my roofs of the houses in the background I need a little stronger stroke Just a suggestion of the houses there. Step back, look at it, see how it's working together. Staying in my middle. And deeper values. But as you see, I'm not going too, too deep. Tying in the warmth that I see in that background in a little bit of the foreground. I'm not taking the time. This is not a finished painting. It's just playing around and doing a sketch in the style of this artist. That's kind of my goal for this series. I know this little tree so well that I can not worry about the image itself. Plus it's not somebody's face, so it doesn't have to be perfect. And I can just play with the color and the technique of applying marks. I think I want to blue this down a little bit too. Let's try that. Oh, I like that. Very nice. It kind of blends those homes into the background because that teal was a little too strong. I do have some lights already in there. I'm going to bring in some sage. I know that one of Lynn's most used colors is a beautiful sage. This one is one of my homemade sages. I have a video on how to reconstitute and use your pastel dust that falls down below your easel. And it's great because you come up with some of these most unusual and beautiful grays and other colors. Notice how I'm sweeping the marks as if they're branches of that tree. Thinking the direction. The direction of the growth of the tree. Branches don't only go out, they also come out at us this way. So we have to keep that in mind. That's why it's a little it seems a little thicker here. It may not be, but because it's more concentrated branches this way, but then the concentrated branches are coming this way, it seems thicker. These are the things you constantly have to think about. I want to bring in the trunk a little stronger. If you notice on these, a lot of the 
evergreens, the branches go directly out from the trunk. And that's why you have these lines. A lot of trees, different types, will have branches that grow in different directions and will stagger one side and then the other up the trunk. But pine trees and fir trees, the branches tend to, like you'll go up a ways and then all the branches go out all the way around the tree. And then it goes up further and then all the way around the tree, the branches come out. Stepping back to think about what I want to do next. This branch heads out, but then it reaches up to the light. Oh, dropped it. Thankfully, I'm on a rug, and I don't worry too much if my vine charcoal is going to break anyway. I want to bring some warmth and maybe some russet qualities down into the foreground a little more. Yeah. Not too much of a good thing. When you add spice, you want to add it, but you don't want to add too much. That one's pretty strong. So I am going to find something that's not quite as strong. Maybe this one. One thing I don't have right now is my strip, my testing strip. Ooh, look at that. I actually have one ready. Now how to clip it onto my board. <laughs> you can probably hear in the background my um, air filter going. Well, it's a good idea to have the air filter on. It absorbs any particles that may fly off into the air so you don't breathe them so much. Okay. Added a little warmth. Some of that red, tied it together. I'm not really excited about my design right now. It just doesn't seem to be working as well as I was hoping it would. So let us bring in, is that the color I already used? No. I'm going to soften some of these areas. Not really blend them, I'm just touching and dragging a little bit. Especially the areas that I want to fade off into the background. This is going to need work. It's lost its interesting shape. I brought in some deeper sage. Let's bring in a lighter sage. That goes there. There's one. I think on the tree. I've watched Lynn work. She works in small, gentle strokes. I should have watched her one of her videos right before I did this, but I was just inspired by that painting that I showed you and I didn't have much time to paint this morning so I wanted to get right to it. I've already had two societal meetings dealing with technology in the societies because for some reason that's what I get pulled in to do. And I did some other work, and then I had a little bit of lunch. 
Okay, I'm going to pull this together now. Looking value-wise, again, I'm running into a problem of the wiggly easel. I need to brace it against the wall, and right now I can't do that. We'll do it for the next painting. Notice how I use the edge, the sharp edge of the pastel, like this sharp edge here. But instead, as I lay it along, I then drag it. So I lay it down, and then I drag it. And it creates a nice sharp shape around the roofs of those buildings. This pastel is skipping over the surface of this paper. It's not playing as well with the paper as some of the others were. So I'm going to pull it in around, kind of vignette, painting a little more here. Possibly blend that. I don't really like that texture too much. And then I'm going to go find another pastel. But I don't want to leave this just in one or two places. It needs to be bouncing around the painting. I think I'm going to go with a yellow. I liked that warmth in the beginning that I had initially chosen. Nice warmth. Now I'm trying to think the negative space around some of these branches. And while I'm doing that, also define the shapes as the branches reach out. Look at this like half circle right there, or that, that curve. That's too obvious. I need to break that up. I didn't notice that until I stood back a little bit. And I don't like that shape so much. That one's a little better, but now it looks like a flag. See the little blue flag right there? I'm going to get rid of that. Once you see something in a painting, it's often difficult to get rid of it. But it's important to. I don't know how this is going to work. I'm not really happy with the shape of this branch either. I'm trying to make it a little more interesting shape. Branch reaching out. This branch needs to reach out. A little more. It's a little better, a little more balanced. I've got a couple clunky branches here. What is going on? They were just like swoop, swoop, and I don't want that. 
This tree is interesting because, I mean, I'm redefining it a little bit, but the this is the ocean side and it pushes everything away from those howling nor'easter winds that come in from the ocean. It pushes them toward the shore side. So you want to be thinking about that as you're painting. Now, while I'm thinking tree, I'm also realizing that this is just a collection of shapes and values and color. I would approach a tree, a house, a landscape, a figure, anything. You can, once you get down shapes, values, which are the most important, and then some color, you can use that approach for any subject matter. So don't be afraid. If, if you find that you're really comfortable with landscapes, but you struggle with a figure, then go try a figure and think, okay, this is, approach the figure like it's a landscape. Just make a trick in your mind. Do some oblique strategies to break away from thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do figures. And, oh, there goes that piece. That's one of my homemade pieces. I want to break up this blue a little bit. Not the blue, I want to break up that, that russet. Bring that down a bit. I keep stepping back so I can see not only from a distance the painting, but also my camera. I will look at my camera because it's small and it gives me a more objective view of the painting. And as I do, this blue just pops right out at me and I'm not liking that. I like the approach, the softness, the variety of some marks in strength and others very quiet. But that blue has got to be adjusted somehow. Oh, it's not the color I wanted. Let's try this one. Nope, that's too. Actually, that might work okay. I just need a little more depth in the lower part of this tree to help anchor it in the picture plane. A couple little craggly branches heading out there that are broken off. And now to do something about this. It's a little too light. And this is a little too blue. Actually, that might work. Okay, let's see what this does. Remember how I had that other blue over the top? It softened it. It's because that teal blue was just too much. What's another thing I can do? I can glaze this with kind of a neutral color. I am going to take my sage and I'm going to try just glazing. Come on, glaze for me, baby. Glaze that blue with some of this sage. Still strong. So let's aim for something in the compliments. A warm 
neutral. That's kind of yellow. That's a little too yellow. Warm, neutral. That might work. Ah, that's better. See how that brings that down? So for the blue complement, I wanted something in the yellow or orange family to bring this down. I'm going to blend gently. I know Lynn doesn't do that. Sorry, Lynn. But I needed to soften those to, to set those back a bit into the picture plane. Step back. I'd like a little more weight down here. I do. This came out pretty nicely. I kind of like that. <laughs> Don't you love it when a plan comes together? Sounds like the old A team. Love it when a plan comes together. I want to catch a little light on the edge of this building. And some depth. Bluish gray, bluish grayish purple. This is always the fun part when you're looking for one of those colors that you can't quite define. Some definitive marks down here. Let's see what Lynn did with that. She let some of the grasses catch a little bit of light. Now, this is in no way at all half or a fraction of the beautiful painting that Lina Selta did. She spent hours on it. I'm just playing with the idea of it to see if it's something I might want to pursue or try again. But here, just in a quick sketch. It's been about 20 minutes since I've been at this. Part of me wants to pull this up more, but I think I'm going to let that fade back. I think I'm going to um, let this kind of rest for now. It was fun. Try these things. Find somebody you admire, you like. Try their painting, do it your image that you're comfortable with, or try one of their images. We learn a lot by following other people. But then we need to get away from all the workshops, all the demos, all the other people's artworks, out of the museums, after we've absorbed everything we possibly can. And we need to step back and assimilate it and let it work through us to come to the point of creating our own voice in our artwork. So try it. I'm going to, I have no idea who I'm doing next, um, but this was fun. I'm, I'm going to touch a couple more things here. I need a little more. What was that color I used there? Yeah, something like that. I want a little more light right behind the tree right here. Kind of like sparkling out. Anyway. Staying dusty, it's what it's all about.